Hi, this is Art News, August 16th. New York galleries, new trends in art, and some AI art. Okay, uh, a good article that I saw. Um, where did I see that? You know, I'm not sure where I saw it. <laughs> Usually I put in a link, but I don't look, it looks like I didn't put in a link this time. So anyway, there are some links in the article to different museums and galleries and things like that. So I'll include those in the description below. So it starts out by talking about New York City's uh, art museums, which are some among, uh, among some of the, the best in the world. You've got the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you have the Museum of Modern Art. You have the Guggenheim. Um, what else do we have? The Whitney. Uh, these are some really great museums in New York. They have branches in other cities around the world, but New York is naturally where everything happens. Um, oh, I see it. The article was on C uh, CNBC's website. So go on to CNBC's website and you can read about the article. Um, and it says that you can essentially vi visit the Whitney, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Guggenheim all in one day, which that is quite a quite an accomplishment. You know, when I went to uh, Italy, when I was in the Biennale in Florence, uh, we took a day trip to Rome, which was kind of crazy because we kind of had a day where we had free, and it's kind of hard to do Rome in a day, but we did. Uh, and I went to the Vatican Museum, um, I saw the Parthenon, I had uh, dinner at a restaurant right across from it, so I get to sit there and look at the Parthenon while I was eating dinner, which is kind of cool. But anyway, uh, just doing the, uh, the Vatican Museum in one day is a lot. And we rode the train down, went to the museum, did all that stuff, and then took the train back. So, but so apparently you can do that in New York too. <laughs> Let's see, um, the, it says that the Whitney is in the um, meatpacking district of Manhattan, the M Museum of Modern Art is in Midtown, and the Guggenheim is further north on the Upper East Side. Uh, but the article was also talking about um, galleries that artists like. So they're, you know, they were listing the, the galleries that artists were recommending. And let's see, they are C24 Gallery, that features work in sculpture, ceramics, and photography, as well as painting. Um, uh, if you dig Chelsea, it'll show an exhibition by filmmaker Steve McQueen on September the 20th, so that's coming up. Uh, Hauser and Wirth, they have two Chelsea galleries, and both are currently showing work by Hungarian-born artist Rita Ackerman is kind of cool. Uh, let's see, Gladstone Gallery. They have two gallery, the two locations in Chelsea also. David's Werner Gallery, uh, currently showing works by 60 artists, no, 60 of its staff, uh, in, bet in between its locations at 519 and 525 West 19th Street. That's where their galleries are located. Uh, there's a Tribeca Gallery, PPOW, which was founded more than 40 years ago by a couple of art dealers, Wendy Olsoff and Penny Pilkington. Okay. Uh, they're currently showing Airhead. Uh, it's a group show based on teaching as a concept. And then there's... Oh, I can't even see that. <laughs> Here, let me uh, zoom in on that one. What does that say? Moriva Gallery. That opened last September, so it's been almost, open almost a year, and it claims to be the first Ukrainian art gallery in New York City. So that's kind of cool. You get to go and see some artists from Ukraine uh, who left there because of the war, and now they're in New York, apparently. <laughs> um, I also saw an interesting article on, on, on their, the website for Apollo Magazine. I'll leave the link down below, um, but it was talking about lesser known abstract expressionist artists. Uh, people are very familiar with the, uh, the famous ones, and there's a lot of them, uh, because it was a big happening New York art scene after World War II, 
and Robert Motherwell coined the phrase New York School because the uh, the label of abstract expressionist was a little too limiting in terms of what was happening in the art scene in New York after the end of World War II. Uh, but the Manhattan Studios um, saw, uh, had, had artists in them that included Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Lee Krasner, William Bazitz, Mark Rothko, Barnett Newman, Richard Pousset Dart, Clifford Still, and Philip Guston. Those were the, and they became the emerging talents and famous artists from that movement. So I'll leave a link to that. That's a pretty good uh, article on Apollo Magazine is the name of that. Um, if you're more interested in new trends in the art world, I found an interesting article on Artnet. Um, it's about intimism and talking about a new generation of artists which are inspired by their, their everyday surroundings. And I'll leave the link to the article down there. Interesting that it's called intimism. You know, artists have done that a lot. Uh, at least the famous artists in modern times, Caravaggio did that. He painted a lot of stuff that was everyday scenes. Uh, Van Gogh obviously did that. He even painted the room that he lived in, you know, with a table and chair, and the window. and <laughs> So, I mean, it's pretty common, but apparently there's a new movement of artists that are painting their everyday surroundings. and It's called intimism. And finally, there's an article uh, telling us to forget about mid-journey and try flux. Uh, if you aren't familiar with what these are, um, they're AI tools and they help artists make AI generated images that they can then use in their art. Uh, obviously since it's a new technology there's a lot of controversy around AI. Um, I use a number of AI tools and I enjoy trying them out to see what I can create uh, with those images that they generate and uh, use them in my artwork. So I play around with those. So it's, you know, I don't know why it's so controversial. You know, the same thing happened over a hundred years ago when they invented the camera. Artists were saying, oh, well, you didn't make that art. You know, you used, you know, the camera made it. You know, it's like, well, you know, that's not true. <laughs> Someone had to take the photograph. Someone had to you know, compose the image and, you know, so, I mean, there's a lot more to it than just that. But eventually photography became an accepted medium within the arts. And I'm sure that AI is going to blossom into something new that artists can use. Unfortunately, a lot of websites like Facebook and um, Instagram and stuff like that are um, putting in tools to, like, flag images, you know, which use AI at as if it's some kind, like it's fake art or something, but it's not. It's you know, if you use AI to create something and then put it into your art that you're creating, you're still creating the whole thing. Is you know, AI may have played a part in it, but AI didn't make the image. Now I will agree that if you use AI to make an image and you try and pass it off as your artwork, yes, that's you know, in my opinion, that's fraudulent and you shouldn't be allowed to do that or should be flagged for doing that but using AI should be allowed just like using a camera is allowed so that's my position on that and hopefully uh, as the technology emerges and these online you know social media websites get a grasp of what it's all about they'll develop tools that will be more uh, in line with the art world so anyway that's my art news for today, so I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.